Isn't it fun to see all those young people? <laughs> Praise God. It's touching to me to, to watch. Um, 30, we're at, we're at uh, 37 years. Is it? Yes. 37 year anniversary. Most churches, the life cycle of a church normally is about 40 years. You have a generation that builds, you know, gathers, builds, you saw that, and they'll build something. And then that generation just more or less ages and then declines and you sell the building and it becomes a bike shop or something. And <clears throat> it, that is not happening. The Lord has been faithful. And I'll tell you why. Um, I think that this church is a planting of the Lord. Uh, I have felt it since I came here. Uh, now, Mary and I had planted a, a couple of other churches. And um, those, actually, after we left, were more or less uprooted. The, the buildings are now, and actually, there's things there now. Um, but the, that congregation got pretty much uprooted in that case. But this one, there's this sense that God put this tree here, and it will go on for, for it'll go on certainly beyond Mary and me. It'll, it'll continue on. He put a, a ministry and a, minist a, a church here, and you can feel it. It has always been remarkable. No matter what you do, you open the doors, people come in, and people get saved. Uh, missions go out. Uh, you, you heard our report earlier. In fact, I forgot to mention our summer mission is back. They were in Lake, uh, Lakewood down here, Four Square Church, doing a fabulous job. God was with them uh, mightily uh, as we ministered to the and lifted up the hands of the Lakewood Four Square Church. I mean, that's just that's just business as usual in this community. As God has set Himself. This isn't, this isn't a, a credit to me or, or Mary or anyone else. It's it's God has set Himself to do work here. And it's been fun to be part of it. Uh, it's been a joy to be part of this community. And uh, I know I speak for a lot of people. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for 37 years. We thank you for however many more, another generation. Lord, we, we, we praise you for the young men and women, the, the, the young people that are rising up in anointing, and in gifting and in calling. We praise you for what you're doing, Father. It has been a, a, a gift and, a, and an honor to be part of what you're doing. And we just commit ourselves to this day. We commit ourselves to this generation. We commit ourselves to be faithful, Lord, right, right, right through to the tape. So come, Holy Spirit, upon us today. Open our ears and eyes. Soften our hearts. Grace us to hear the word. We need your word and we need your presence. With that, we can do anything. We can go forward. Strengthen us now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, we're in John chapter 8. <clears throat> I, uh, w it, was, it was several weeks ago that we went through, we went through the, the account where a woman is brought before Jesus and placed he, in, in front of him and said, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Remember this? Yeah. Uh, that actually took place the day after the Feast of Booths, and the day after the Feast of Booths there in Jerusalem is Simcha Torah. It's a day for celebrating the Torah, the first five books of Moses, the Law of Moses, and a recommitment to it. And so on that very day, uh, the Pharisees, the re religious leaders, and these are ultra-Orthodox Jews, they bring this woman and put her in front of Jesus there in the court of the women. That's the one right outside the place where the altar burnt offering and the temple itself is it's it's it, there's the big outer court of the gentiles but this is the court of the women right in there is where jesus is teaching they bring her and they don't throw her on the ground you, that's usually what you see in the movies uh, they just stood her there and they said we caught this woman in the act of adultery the law of moses says she should be stoned what do you say so they're now going to challenge him. Will he, will he turn away from the clear instructions of the law of Moses? Will he, will he go with it or will he not? On this day, Simcha Torah, what's he going to do? And uh, you recall what he did? <laughs> he, he, he knelt down and began with his finger to write in the dirt and just sat there looking at the dirt and writing in this. Uh, and they pressed him further and they said, we want an answer. And he stood up and he said, he looked at them and he said, 
the one of you that is without sin, you cast the first stone at her. Remember this? You cast the first stone. And then it says he knelt down again and with his finger started writing in the dirt again. We saw what that meant. Uh, there is a prophecy in Jeremiah. Now put this together. It's just really profound. There's a prophecy in Jeremiah in which Jeremiah says, My people, the Lord's speaking through him, the Lord says, My people have rejected me, the fountain of living water, and have hewn for themselves cisterns. Those are, those are where you dig a big hole out of a rock, and then you line it with plaster, and you store water in it. Uh, uh, through the, the, the rice. And it says, yeah, they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, they cannot hold water. In other words, they've turned away from me the fountain of living water. The day before this, Jesus stood as the priest was pouring out water, remembering the rock that gave the water in the wilderness. And Jesus said, is anyone thirsty? Let him come to me and drink, and out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He presents himself as the fountain of living water. And, and so then the next day, they put the woman in front of him. He kneels down and he starts writing in the dirt. Let me tell you the next thing Jeremiah says. He says, they have, they have, my people have, have, have rejected me, the fountain of living water, and have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Their names shall be written in the dirt. Their names shall be written in the dirt, as opposed to written in heaven, yeah. in, the, in the Lord's book of life. Yeah. You follow this? So there he is. They're all going to throw, you want to throw rocks at her. He says, the one with you, of you that has fulfilled the law and doesn't deserve to be stoned, you go ahead and throw the first stone. And he writes, goes down and writes their names in the dirt, <laughs> as it were. I mean, they, look, they, that, that prophecy is very well known. It's still quoted. You go to Israel today, they quote it. Every time I go, I hear that, that one quoted. So this is a very live prophecy. And there he is writing their names in the dirt. Well, they had integrity. I got to hand it to those guys. Um, because one at a time, they just said, ah, we're out. And they backed out and left. When they were all gone, Jesus stood up and he said, <clears throat> where are your accusers? And she said, there are none, Lord. And then he said, Neither do I accuse you or condemn you. Then he said something else. What? Go and sin no more. Yeah. That has just happened. Uh, and I felt, I, we, we talked about it, and I felt like the Lord said, no, you've got to go back and look at it again. So I'm, today I want to show you something. But I'm going to show you something from the passage that, we are, that we're reading today. And that's chapter 8, verses uh, 19 through 24. The debate goes, these religious leaders begin to argue with him, and we have this debate going, and Jesus says this, they were saying to him, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Would you say that line? If you knew me, know my father also. Once more, if you knew me, you would know my father also. This is a huge theme in the Gospel of John. Jesus says, when you see me, you see God. Everything I say is what he, I heard him say. Everything I do is exactly what I saw him do. You, as you watch me, you are watching God in the flesh, how he functions. You can tell what he likes, he doesn't like. You can tell what he thinks about things, how he handles things. You, when you watch me, if you knew the Father, you'd know me. If you know me, you'd know the Father. You follow this? Don't, he says to Philip later on, why do you say, show us the Father? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I mean, it couldn't be clearer. That's just what's going on right there. He says to them, you should, you should see me and know who I am. These words he spoke in the treasury, which is an area of that court of the women, as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. And then he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and, you, I, and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. 
So the Jews were saying, and when it says Jews, it does not mean all the Jewish people. It means the religious leaders. The religious leaders were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. And he's not talking about hell. He's talking about the world. You are of this world. I am not of this world. And therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, and does yours have the word he in italics? You know why? It's not there in the Greek. But the translators feel like something should be there, so they put he in. makes them feel better. Uh, for unless, it says literally, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Let's look at our study guide. We're talking today about rules. It's getting confusing. Many Christians seem headed in opposite directions. One group is becoming more and more legalistic, pointing to all the rules in the Old Testament and insisting that they are eternal, which means they must be obeyed forever. Another group is becoming more and more lawless, pointing to the fact that when Jesus died for our sins, he died for all of them, so it doesn't matter if a believer continues to sin. They say everything is under grace. Both groups quote from the Bible to support their positions, but they say very different things and present a very different picture of God. One group is rediscovering the law. The other group is abandoning it altogether. So who's right and what, who's wrong? And what if both are wrong? Then how would we discover the right way? Are we supposed to obey all those rules or not? And the most important question of all is, how do we know for sure that we're right? Thankfully, there is an answer, a rock-solid answer. And it's not an answer that comes from someone's opinion or a clever argument. It's an answer that comes from God himself. But he doesn't tell us this answer. He shows us his answer. He lets us watch as he applies his own rules to someone who has broken the rules. And what we discover is that he is neither legalistic nor lawless. He's exactly like Jesus. Now, would you turn that over to your daily Bible study? I'm going to look at Sunday and Monday. And if I feel in the mood, I'll do Friday and Sunday, Saturday. All right. Yeah. I want to, this is back to verse 19 that we, we heard. Their, odd, their question is odd, these religious leaders asked of Jesus. They asked him, where is your father? We might have expected them to ask, who is your father? And if they had, it would have revealed that they were confused about who he meant when he kept referring to my father or the father who sent me. But by now, the religious leaders in Jerusalem knew the special relationship Jesus was claiming when he called God, his father. During an earlier encounter, John reported their reaction to him this way. The Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was calling God his own father, making himself what? Equal with God. Look at that. So they were, weren't confused. They were offended. They were trying to mock him. They were daring him to show them God. In effect, they were saying, if you have such a special relationship with God, prove it. If he's your second witness that will confirm that you are who you claim to be, let's see him. Jesus responded, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. He was saying they needed to stop judging him according to the flesh. If they really wanted an answer to their question, all they needed to do was observe the active work of God taking place through him. Jesus was powerfully and accurately expressing the character and works of God. This was not the first time they were hearing him teach or watch him, watching him minister. They had seen him many times before, and if at any point they had evaluated the situation honestly, they would have recognized the Father's wisdom Power, compassion, and presence at work through him. Jesus would not show them the Father by performing a miracle to let them peer into heaven. There was plenty of evidence right in front of them. When, we, when I mentioned just now the Salishan mission, you know, the VBS that just was held, 
I mentioned that there was a tremendous peace over the camp, right? Over the gathering. You've got, you've got 200 plus uh, children and youth, um, unchurched and, and low economic situations for the most part. That is not a prescription for peace. But the peace was there. And even observers, people who have no idea, are sensing this peace. How do they do that? They do it through their spirit. Look, I, I, I'll just, I'm going to keep saying this. You are a spiritual being. You don't have to try. It isn't when you become a Christian, you're born that way. For we have been made in God's image. That means spiritual. Every human on the planet is spiritual. Every human's spirit is working. And they're aware of things. They don't all understand what they're aware of. They don't know where it comes from. They're often told it's either hormones or psychology or, or they're, you know, some kind of evolved tendency. But they're feeling these things. Picture this. There is Jesus ministering. You're watching him heal the sick. You're watching him cast devils out of people that are in absolute torment. And you're looking at them with clear eyes a smile on their face, and their conscious personality back in place. You're, 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 you're feeling... I mean, if, if we think the Lord is here right now, the sweet presence of God, do you feel any peace in the room? Yeah. Can you picture when Jesus ministered what the, feel, what the feeling would be? The sense that would be there? Any honest person, any honest person would have to say, something's going on here. Something is happening right here, and it's really good. There's a lot of love here. There's a lot of peace here. There's a lot of power here. Like, wow, this is awesome. You'd have, any honest person would say it. Whether you liked it, what you saw or not, you'd have to admit that. Here they are saying to him, where is the Father? And basically, C.S. Lewis said this. He said, God doesn't do tricks. He will not do a little trick for you to prove to something to you. God, if you're real, make the moon come up purple or the sky turn pink. Come on. If you're, I'll believe in you if you do something. You know, God is just like, he's not going to help you at all. He won't do a trick for you. If he does a healing, it's because love constrained him to. If he, does, if he does a work and a miracle, it's because love and the wisdom and plan of God needed that miracle. Do you follow this? You don't, tri you, don't, you don't test him. You don't play with him. You don't ask him to do a trick for you, to show you he's real. What, he, what Jesus says to them is, no, you, they're kind of implying, would you pull the curtain of heaven aside and let us see the Father? That will, be, will satisfy us. And he's going, if, you don't, if you're not honest enough and integrous enough, to acknowledge what your heart and your eyes, you're seeing and feeling right now. If you're, if you're willing to deny those things clearly, showing you, pulling back the curtain of heaven won't make a bit of difference. You're hard. You're rebellious and you're defying what your heart tells you already know. He said, you're, if you, you don't see the Father in me, you wouldn't see him if I showed him to you. You follow this? Look, it's the one, you, can, you can literally preach God by peace. Just the peace and presence and sweetness of the Lord in a place. People will walk in and after a while they're going, so what's up with this? What's happening here? This is really something. What's going on in here? Right? They feel it. Because it's real. This isn't emotions. It's not hormones. This is real. I, I'm in the mood for Friday. Would you, would you, would you, yeah, go, yay. Now I want to I, I show you how this ties in. Friday and Saturday. He, Jesus told those Pharisees, these Pharisees, that they won't go to heaven because there is something they do not believe. What is it they, do, they don't believe? Jesus said they don't believe I am. And no, he didn't say what it was he is. It's possible he expected them to finish the statement with some of the things he had said recently, such as I am the light of the world or I am the one who knows where I came from and where I'm going. But it's also possible he meant by I am 
something that he was going to say at the very end of this conversation, that he is the I am who existed before Abraham. That means he is the I am who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush. In other words, he's asking them to believe that he is the divine son of God. And if they don't, he says they will die in their sins. When we read this dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees, we might assume that he was asking them to believe something so unfamiliar to someone raised in Judaism that no one could believe it. Who could blame the Pharisees for doubting that this man who was standing there and talking to them was God's son? That he was, could be the I am of the Old Testament. But in fact, John will soon say that many came to believe in him. And he specifically mentions that those numbers included Jews, meaning religious leaders or Pharisees. So that Jesus is saying, so pardon me, so what Jesus is saying about himself is not foreign to their ear. Their debate was not about could such a thing be, could God have a son, or could that son become a man? Their debate was about whether or not Jesus was the son of God for whom they had been waiting. It's important to note that many of these people who were highly educated in the Bible believed his claim. Do you see what I'm saying? In fact, it gets worse. They all knew Lazarus. And when Lazarus died, they all went to his funeral. I mean, all these top leaders. Lazarus is a prominent uh, figure and, and name. Uh, a very prestigious man somehow. So he's got all the top leaders are, are there and are staying at his house during a wake, you know, while, they, while they're, uh, they're having the, the morning season. And then Jesus shows up and says, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes out of the tomb in front of their eyes. That stirred things up. In fact, Caiaphas, who's a wicked man, he's the high priest at, the, at this point in time. He's an evil man. Caiaphas says, if we don't do something quickly, everybody's going to believe in him. All these Jews are going, yes, you are the son of God. You follow this? The fact the trend is so strong, they got to kill him before everybody goes across. I just want you to see that. All right, let's go back to rules. The Bible is full of rules. Things God commanded us to do and things he commanded us to not do. Someone counted and said there are 613 of these rules in the first five books of the Bible alone. Rules about daily life, how to perform religious ceremonies, how to conduct civil government, how to manage business matters, and how to prosecute criminal activities. As you read through these rules, you soon discover they're not the sort of rules that humans make up on their own. Anyone who observes these rules ends up living a living life very differently from those who don't. At their root, God's rules are designed to teach us how to love, how to love him and how to love each other. And each rule has been given to us as an expression of his love for us. These are not rules he's just sort of sticking on top of us and saying, I want you to do these things or else. These are expressions of his love for us. He is calling us upward. Say upward. He, <coughs> he's calling us upward to become like him. Peter said, like the one who, is called, who called you to be holy yourselves, call, called you, pardon me, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Yeah. You got to see this. This is becoming very real to me. When God gives these standards, and you can think about the, the food standards he has, you can think about the sexual standards he has, you can think about the things he has financially, the worship he asks of them, all of these things. You can say, are those just a whole bunch of rules? What it is, is God calling us upward. His thinking, you are my children, not my little subjects. You are my children, and I'm raising you up to become like me. I don't do that stuff. I don't want you doing that stuff. Now, come on. Is there a parent in the room, is there a parent in existence who has not said this? I don't care 
what the neighbors let their kids do. You're not doing that because you're a, and fill in your last name, right? Our family doesn't do that. Yes? God is saying, I don't care what the neighbors are doing. You're not going to have sex like that. You're not going to eat that garbage. You are not going to talk like that or treat the poor like that. Why? You belong to me. You're my children. Our family doesn't do that. And it, it's a matter of being lifted upward. Look, this is where we're going. This is the whole goal of the thing. You and I are becoming children of God. It's not just about getting saved and living someplace with, with, you know, with a harp. It's about being lifted up into a relationship with our Father forever. We will shine like Christ. We will be like Christ. You're on your way to something that is absolutely wordless. There's, you can't describe it. This is where we're going. It's what the Bible says. I didn't make this up. I couldn't. We're being called upward. Say upward. upward. Yeah, you're being called upward. His, 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 his standards all are lifting us upward. Some of the rules are stern. Some have punishments that are severe, even calling for death. But as we'll learn today, God doesn't give them to us to hurt us, but to bring us back to him. His goal is to correct us, not destroy us. How do we know that? It's right here in front of us in John chapter 8. The God who wrote the rules is showing us how to apply his rules. Jesus said, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. He's telling us to watch him because, what? because he's doing exactly what the father would do. All right, then what did he do? When a woman who was indisputably guilty of breaking a very important rule was placed in front of Jesus. Her accusers asked him for a verdict. The first thing we have to observe is what he did not do. He didn't enforce the rules. Say that. He didn't enforce the rules. Yeah, every service has had a little hard time saying that. It's like, are you supposed to say that? He didn't enforce the rules. Say that with me. He didn't. He just didn't. Instead, he used the rules to show her her need of grace. Now, the law of Moses does command that a person who, who did what she did should die. So you would think that the God who wrote that rule would want his rule carried out. But he didn't. He didn't want a dead woman. He wanted a repentant heart. He didn't want a convicted criminal. He wanted her back. The clash between Jesus and the Pharisees was a clash between these two views. They saw the law of Moses as a standard which must be met or God would be angry. Jesus saw the law as a tool to drive desperate people back to God. Paul said it this way. Why don't you read this with me out loud? The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The picture is that the law with these standards exposes our sin, shows us our shortcomings, not so that we will all get stoned to death, but so it takes us by the hand and leads us to Christ, leads us to grace. <clears throat> Do you know the, when, I, when I say the term the altar of burnt offering? Do you know what that is? That when, you, when you're in the tabernacle or the temple there in Israel, the, you, the, you'd come in the, you come in the gate, and the first thing that's there in the, in the, in the court of the temple itself is this big uh, altar of uh, burnt offering. And that's where you have the morning and the evening sacrifice. So you're about 9 o'clock in the morning, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're having a sheep or a, a goat or a, or a bull or something being offered on that altar. The purpose of it is this. It says, we are sinners. And the priest will put his hand, you know, pray over this thing and transfer our sin to this. 
And Lord, we call on you as the, as the smoke goes up. We are calling upon you for mercy. There's an alarm in our spirit <laughs> that we need forgiveness. You know, when, when you... When you <clears throat> When you, look, when you look in the Old Testament, I, I've been, I'm reading through the Old Testament. You're reading through the Bible, too. And uh, as, we, as we read through it, you will find that there's these, re, these renewal times where people come back to God. Uh, the first thing they do, notice this when you do it, when you read again. The first thing you, they do is they reestablish the altar of burnt offering. When they, when they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem after coming back from exile, the very first thing they built, the altar of burnt offering. What is the nation saying? We're sinners and we need forgiveness. Do you hear it? This is where everything starts. This is the foundation thing. This is what everything else comes from that. We are sinners. Have mercy on us, God. Calling on God for mercy, not justice. Mercy, not justice. In the introduction to this gospel, John said this. What, read this with me, would you? For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized, came into being, through Jesus Christ. Moses was a great man. Through him, God gave us a wonderful gift. The first five books of the Bible, that's the Torah or the law, in which God reveals many aspects of his will. But through Jesus Christ, grace and truth were not only shown to be essential elements of God's character, through Jesus, grace and truth actually came into being. In other words, Jesus not only showed them to us, he made them available to us. But we must not think that God showed no mercy before Jesus arrived. If I say this, do you understand the cross is the center of human history? The, if you go back before the cross, let's go back 1,400 years. Let's go back to, Israel, uh, to, to Moses. When, when Moses, or, or let's go back further. Let's go back to Abraham or even Adam and Eve. You've been having people laying hands on some poor sheep praying, transferring their sins to it, cutting the thing's throat, and offering it up in a sacrifice since, a, since Adam and Eve, or at least since Seth, their son. So you've, you've had it going on all along. Do, do you think, do they think, that some dead goat forgives their sins that they've just committed? No, they don't. In fact, that's the whole point you read in the book of Hebrews. The blood of bulls and goats never has forgiven anybody's sin. And they're not so foolish. They thought it did either. But it was a type. It was, it was a prophetic uh, illustration, a symbol. They didn't know what exactly would happen, but they knew that God would somehow supply a sacrifice for their sins. And it would involve death. They knew that all along. So they're calling on God for his mercy through the death of a substitute. Remember when Abraham is there on Mount Moriah and he's about to sacrifice Isaac, uh, after God gave him a ram caught in the thicket and spared his son, uh, Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh, which means in the mountain of the Lord, a sacrifice will be provided. He will provide his own sacrifice, his own ram caught in a thicket on this place. It was within a few hundred yards. Jesus died on the cross. That's the very place that the sacrifice would be held in the future with the burnt offerings. Do you follow this? It, it, it has always come back to this, 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 uh, this, our need of grace, of his mercy. We, in the Old Testament, look forward to the cross. Now, 2,000 years later, we look back to the cross. I took communion. Did I this service? No, but last service I did. I take the bread and I take the cup, and I am thinking back 2,000 years to his death on the cross, right? I am trusting it. What was done atones my sin. Abraham trusted what would be done would atone his sin. You follow? the center of all history. A merciful God. God has always been a merciful God who didn't want to judge people, but longed 
for them to repent and return to him. The entire Old Testament is full of examples of people who disobeyed God, deserved punishment, even death, but were given grace. That's because God's essential nature is love. But if people forget that fact and forget that he is a savior and take those rules at face value, the result is that they end up fearfully trying to keep each rule so God won't become angry and demanding everyone else do the same. Think about it. Cain murdered his brother Abel, but instead of ordering him to be executed, God gave him a sign to protect him. What is up with that? You'd, put, you'd think he'd put a bullseye on him, not a, not a protective sign. Or the nation of Israel worshiping a golden calf shortly after swearing to be loyal to God and calling down curses on themselves if they disobeyed. Yet God didn't curse them. He didn't even leave them. He continued leading them to the promised land. Where is the justice in that? What happened to the rules? Ezra captures the mercy of God in his great prayer. I'd like you to see that. Would you go with me to Nehemiah chapter 9? Nehemiah is just to the left of Psalms. And would somebody, uh, when our ushers hit the air conditioning button back there, Ezra, or um, pardon me, Nehemiah, but Nehemiah is describing Ezra praying. This is, this is after the, uh, the exile. This is 100 years after the first group came back. And they're, they're coming back, and they have, they're beginning to rebuild the altar and all of the, the things that I've said. And they will have built the walls up at this point, and they've got their, their temple. And Ezra leads the nation in prayer. I want you to see. Here's what I want you to observe. Ezra will constantly confess. He'll do this about four different cycles. I won't take you through all four. But he'll keep saying, you blessed us. You were good to us. And then we defied you and broke all of your rules. And then instead of, instead of destroying us, you forgave us and blessed us again. And then once we got good and blessed, we turned our back on you and you punished us again. And, and we repented and you blessed us again. And then we, and you see this constant cycle. Watch, watch this because he will, he's capturing, he's telling you about the merciful heart of God. Look at this. I'll start at verse 9 Ezra says, you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. And then you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and against all his servants and all, of, all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly toward them and made a name for yourself as it is to this day. You divided the sea before them. So they passed through them in the, the midst of the sea on dry ground. And their pursuers you hurled to the depths. And then he says, you led them by day with a pillar of fire by night to light their way for them. And you came down, verse 13, on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and laid down commandments, statutes and law through your servant Moses. And then notice, bread from heaven, water from a rock. Do you notice how those parallel what we're learning in, in John? Jesus is constantly being all of these things. These are just the symbols of, of the Gospel of John. And he says, you told each of them to enter the land. Look at verse 16. But they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commands. They refused to listen and did not, rem you did, and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you performed among them. They became st stubborn and appointed a leader to return to Egypt. Now read out loud with me. I don't care what version you have. Read his next statement. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. Did you hear that? He describes his character, and then he'll go back, and he says, and then they went and made a molten calf for themselves, and you and your great compassion did not zap them and leave them little greasy puddles on the on the on the on the desert floor as you should have, but you gave them a pillar of fire and led them. You gave them their spirit to it. You fed them manna for 40 years. You cared for them, even though they broke every one of your, they broke your most essential rule and defied you. And then you gave them kingdoms and you prospered them. You made them numerous, the stars. 
and then they sinned again again against you. Verse 26, they became disobedient, rebelled against you, and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who admonished them so that they might return to you. Committed great blasphemies, and therefore you delivered them into the hand of their oppressors. But when they cried to you in the time of distress, you heard from heaven, and according to your compassion, you gave them deliverers. Verse 28, but as soon as they had rest, they did evil again. Come on, is this encouraging? <laughs> the God who wrote those rules, who said, if you break them, I will abandon you, I will zap you. I mean, go through the list. I mean, you get crickets and mildew on top of everything else. It's, it's just, all of this is going to fall on you if you do it. And then they did it. What's the matter with him? Can't he read? It says right here. He's supposed to destroy them. But he kept being merciful. I want you to see something. Jesus is not introducing a new concept. He is not throwing out the God of the Old Testament. Don't ever let people tell you that. Some mean old God of the Old Testament. Jesus is being the true prophet right now. And he's saying, it has always been this God. He has never wanted dead people. He's always wanted repentance. He is as accurate as Isaiah or Jeremiah. Or he, is, he is speaking the word of the Lord and bringing the confusion and the misuse of the law right back into, into, into clarity. I won't keep going because he keeps cycling. Here we go. Let's go back to our text. He replays for the nation their entire history and shows them how many times they deserve total destruction. Yet God kept giving them mercy. In other words, he didn't follow his own rules. So when Jesus does what he does, gives mercy to a guilty woman, he isn't inventing some new interpretation of the law. He's reminding the Pharisees how their God has always, it gets me every time, treated their people, his people. He's reminding them how their God is merciful. What didn't he do? As we've seen when a guilty woman was placed in front of Jesus for judgment, he didn't enforce the rules, but, left, but, but he didn't change the rules either. He left God's moral code firmly in place and warned her to bring her lifestyle up to God's standards. After her accusers had left, he said, and I don't condemn you either. Go from now on, what? Sin no more. He said the same sort of thing to a man he healed by the pool of Bethesda. He said, behold, you've become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. And he doesn't mean you'll get polio next time. What he's saying is, if you don't repent, when you get on the other side of death, it gets way worse. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Notice that person is, is in the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting the way he says that, and he means what he says. So he's talking, but he says you'll be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called the he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We learn from these things he taught from things he taught later and from his apostles that what he meant by keeping even the least of these commandments were the moral teachings of the law, not all the religious rules, because he fulfilled all those religious requirements for us. Let me you, you follow the distinction I just made. There is basic moral laws. Do not kill, do not lie, do not steal, uh, etc. Have no other gods before you. And then there's the, you've got the religious ceremonial laws. You've got you know, the Sabbath laws and you've got the food laws and you've got the uh, tithing and the day, days and the calendar and, uh, and what you wear and don't wear and uh, you know, all of these kinds of things. You've got all of those ceremonial laws. Jesus fulfilled for us all the ceremonial. The moral laws are eternal. They are the character of God. It won't be right to steal, kill, or, or lie a billion years from now. That never changes. That's who he is. Those, uh, 
those ceremonial laws have passed away unless a person wishes to use them as a way to teach the Bible or express worship. So grace is not an excuse to keep on sinning. It's the opportunity to keep on trying. That is so good, and I wrote that. So I'd, I'd, like, haha, I'd like you to read that out loud with me, if you would. So grace is not an excuse to keep on sinning. It's the opportunity to keep on trying until we learn how to obey. See that? Grace is a father giving us mercy and time and, 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 his, and his help while he's raising children. It's not a judge looking for a verdict. It's a father raising children. We, what does he want for us to do? The same thing. Receive grace and recommit to the standard. Say that. Receive grace and recommit to the standard. Give grace and help people reach the standard. Say that. Give grace and help people reach the standard. We're not to ignore the standard or change the standard, but neither are we to use the standard harshly. We must always hope that a person will repent, not that they be given the justice they deserve. Here are some guidelines to help us understand how we should and should not use God's rules. We should let his rules convict us of sin and drive us to repentance and grace. We should not use them to try to earn our salvation or gain favor with God. We should let God's rules teach us how to live godly lives. Paul said, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. We should not use those rules to condemn people, but always to seek to bring them back to God. We should let God's rules reveal his heart and character. He is very different from us, and his rules teach us about those differences. We should see his rules as a gift of his love calling his children upward to become like him. How can we be sure of this? Because we just watched Jesus apply those rules. And if we know him, we know the Father also. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Isn't that radical? Only as, you, as, 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 you, as the Lord shows us, Jesus is actually not introducing something new. He's, he's bringing people back to the God who is always. He never meant his law to be a way of getting a whole lot of people stoned to death. He always meant it. To, he always. When, pe when people will repent, there is a mercy from our God. Always has been. Hallelujah. Always will be. At least up to the end of the age. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Our Father, we come before you this day. And we see a heart we can trust. You are pure and you are holy. And you are calling us upward to be sons and daughters of yours. To become like you. It is an honor. And we gladly, to this day, put our hand in yours and surrender to you. I really feel the Lord's ministering this. Uh, as you... As, as you see the heart of God, it isn't only a matter of admitting your failures and saying, well, I'm, so, I'm grateful for the mercy. And of course, we are profoundly grateful. We're all survival in it. But is the, am I willing to say, Father, it doesn't matter what the neighbors are doing. Your family behaves this way. And I'm part of your family now, and you're my father. And so I allow you with my speech, I allow you with my, my, the way I treat people, I allow you to, to, with my sexuality, I allow you with my, uh, my finances, I allow you with every part of my life. I am your child, and you've called me upward to be like you, holy. And so I yield to that, and I yield to it gladly. I want to become like your beautiful son, Jesus. In all things, I know that's the calling, and I I'm gladly embrace it. And I surrender to that process, knowing that every time I fail, that I have mercy as I repent and come back and get back on track, and you teach me your ways. Yeah. I love you, Father. I want to be like you. Blessed be God. Anybody today, just you just need to make that, that, that simple step of, 
of, of trust is really what it is, of putting your hand in his and saying, I, I'm not going to fight it. I'm not going to argue with it. I'm going to let the word of God and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit uh, form me and mold me. And I want to become a son or a daughter of the living God. And uh, I just yield to that process. Anyone need to raise your hand and say, I, I know I need to make that act of submission. Would you raise your just, I'm just going to just acknowledge it. Father, see our hands. We're surrendering. We're responding to your word. When we see how you treated that woman caught in the act of adultery, when we see the kindness and yet the integrity of Jesus, he didn't change the standards, but he gladly offered her mercy that she might become yours. Lord, we can trust you. With a God like that, we can, we can do this salvation. I mean, this is one we can walk in. This is one that can save people like us. And so we put our hand in yours. We surrender gladly to you and say you are our Father. You're holy. And you want us to be like you. So we welcome that. We submit to it. We yield to it. We invite it in Jesus' powerful name. If you agree with that, would you say amen? amen? Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.